midnight. The start of a new millennium, and 36 men, women and children are cast away on the remote Hebridean island, Taransay. A cross-section of the British population, they will spend a year living and working together as they build a new community and reflect on the lives they have left behind. Castaway 2000 is the story of what they learn about each other and themselves. Uh, it's New Year's Day. No, there's no food. <laughs> Everybody's ill and um, there's just not enough food. <coughs> Before they'd even started the year, over half the community was struck down by a flu epidemic and the building of the accommodation was severely delayed due to bad weather. Then four of the castaways learned that their packing crates full of essentials for their year away had been dropped during the airlift to the island. It's, it's ruined. <laughs> All this stuff from home that you just spent such a long time putting together, it's, it's wrecked. <laughs> Just hours into the new year, there's more bad news, as Dubliner Poreg Nallan is airlifted off with a suspected broken leg. And he's not alone in leaving the island. Those worst affected by the flu virus are joined by four of the castaway families who are leaving for the neighbouring island of Harris, until Taransay is in a fit state to return. It's not the start to the year the community had hoped for. Dreaming of a white Christmas. During their second night, the island was hit by gale force winds and the most severe storms in recent history. For the castaways, it's an early taste of life in the Western Isles, and by the morning of day three, they're counting the cost. Their incomplete and patched up buildings were no match for the Force 11 gales, which have torn the roof from one of the buildings and dumped it 200 yards away. With no sign of a break in the weather, it's up to the castaways to carry out makeshift repairs to prevent any further damage. Basically, half the roof off the whole of the toilet block has come off. One of the, um, the pig sheds missed. Just missed the polytunnels. Just missed the polytunnels by just a couple of feet. Start at the beginning again. Rebuild. We'll not give up. Don't give up, no, 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 no. I, don't, I think all of us <laughs> trying to stand up. <laughs> no, that's it. We'll just start, start over again. I think this is going to be the precedent for the next few months, really. We sort of expected it. I just didn't expect it quite so soon. I think we'll go hang gliding today, OK? <laughs> Without the layer of turf needed to secure the roofs, the unfinished accommodation pods haven't escaped the damage either. We should have really, in an ideal world, got all the felt on here and uh, waterproofed it properly and turfed it straight away for the weight to keep the roof on so the wind wouldn't have had a chance to do this. Then You can't do everything at once, it's just a question of prioritising. And sometimes things can happen, but, you know, chin up, let's do it again, no problem. Challenge after bloody challenge, though, innit? I tell you, God. The castaways' next challenge is to find the food supply they have been given for their first month on the island. Well, we're just trying to locate this uh, food that has gone missing. And uh, I thought I'd have a quick look in the pig side. There's no pigs in them, there might be some food. It's cold. It's cold, yeah. There's absolutely nothing in there. So, uh, we might just go and check out over there. There's quite a lot of stuff underneath the tarpaulin. That's a good fire. That's nothing yet, Liz. No, we thought, we thought it might be under this red tarpaulin. But all we found is candles and smoke alarms. And, and flat pack furniture. <laughs> <laughs> Which isn't very helpful when you're hungry. <laughs> I think this might be too big there. There's loads of chaos, but chaos is sort of creative. I mean, you can only make things happen out of chaos. You know, because the bits are all there, you've got to assemble them, form patterns into them. So chaos doesn't phase me at all, as long as, you know, a bit of order emerges out of it, you know, down the line, and if you can see that happening, that is happening. And that's really, really, uh, you know, encouraging, I think. The castaway community will have a farmhouse, a schoolhouse, a converted barn, 
and four accommodation pods to live, work and sleep in. All the electricity on the island will be generated by a wind turbine and hydroelectric pump installed and managed by the castaways themselves. How much we allow the Inside the converted barn or steading is a kitchen where the castaways will prepare their food and a social area where they will eat communally and spend what leisure time they can find. To help them survive their first winter, they will have a limited budget to spend on food and materials. But they will ultimately grow their own fruit and vegetables in three polytunnels, which they will plant up and cultivate throughout the year. Overlooking the sea, the schoolhouse will be used for education and social activities. But for the time being, it's where the castaways will sleep until their individual pod rooms are finished. But it's the steading that provides the main focus of life during the early days on Taransay. And it's here that the castaways meet every day to discuss the priorities of their new life together. With so much work to do before the families can return, rotors are quickly drawn up as the castaways set about improving the state of their new home. But not everyone's convinced that the priorities are necessarily right. It's about second of January. Really. And we're gardening. And all the buildings are weeding, falling down. <laughs> I just heard Ray there saying second of January and we're gardening. Well, we're not gardening. I mean, we had the discussion at the meeting last night where this was all going to become a quagmire. So we decided we would actually get it sorted get a proper wall in, clear out this, just get all the rubble away so that it's a nice path to walk through. Bray's already started with all those white stones and we don't really want white stones with these stones. We just want, would like a nice two walls of big, big rocks, rocks like this. So we've got a bit of an issue, really. They're crazy. Ray decides that crazy paving is not for him and heads off to try the local fishing. Wally, nice day today. Over on the neighbouring island of Harris, those who decided to leave Taransay have settled into their temporary accommodation, where they are joined by Porig, fresh from hospital, and members of the production team, not so fresh from their time on the island. Yeah, I mean, I don't really mind so much about the leg. It's the, the fact that I'm off the island and I can't work, um, that's really annoying me. I mean, I, I am pissed off that I can't, I can't work. I mean, there's a lot of stuff to be done and I really want to do it. Uh, so at the moment I can see myself sitting around reading, writing and making cups of tea for people and that's about it. I mean, just looking at everybody's unshaven faces off the island, it's, um, it makes you feel a little, you know, more comfortable. Um, but uh, I'd, I'd rather be over there uh, under the right circumstances. We don't know what they're thinking over there. They, might, they may be thinking that, you know, we're just opting out and having a cushy time, which, I mean, we are having a cushy time, but we don't want to be doing that. We'd I mean, much rather be living over there and helping get things sorted. But it's just not feasible when we haven't got anywhere to sleep or, or anywhere reasonable to sleep. We're not prepared to rough it to the extent that they are. I think, I mean, I was not as overprotective as a parent. I mean, I think that people are a bit too overprotective, and I think that I, the kids had a whale of a time. They were running around, they were loving it. You know, and they were getting stuck in, and we had one of the kids who was whinging earlier on, you know, making a table, and I mean, just get them working and doing, you know, things. I mean, but, but I mean, I'm not, you know, I've done that bit. My parent, you know, my kids have flown the nest. I mean, and I reckon every elder person, oh, they're doing it wrong, you know. <laughs> But I just think they should get here early. They're going to feel a bit left out. Um, I can understand if their children are ill, and there are some which, you know, that are actually physically ill, then I agree, maybe it's best to sort of just wait a, few, a day till they're fit and strong. But uh, those that have got... Those that are a bit miffed about the state of the place, I think that's a mistake. Personally, I think that's a mistake, but that's, their, that's an individual call, isn't it? You know, I've been talking to a couple of their families, and they don't sound very uh, enthusiastic, you know. But uh, maybe they might change their mind over there in the hotel. On the afternoon of day three, Ben and Sandy are sent over to visit Gordon Carey and the other castaways who are not on Taransay to report on recent events. There is a possibility that a few of you are going to be here for a couple of weeks and we're going to be there. And we're sorting, we're sorting out food and various other things. Yeah. 
So we decided that it would probably be a good idea just to come over and just basically, yeah, because we are tell supposed to all be happening. together and just tell, tell you what's, what's happening. happening. Yeah. There was a bit of a storm last night. Yeah, we know, yeah. Well, a little bit. Down. Was there any damage done? Yeah, yeah. Well, there was, the pods, some of the, the felt on top has been ripped off. Oh, God. The toilet block roof got a little bit damaged. The half roof that came off was a really last minute thing. The builders were told, get it finished as soon as you can. And it was blatantly a, a rush job. This was all, you know, this, this was going to be our main um, challenge of the whole year, the weather. Mm. And that's what, you know, I, I think we can all agree with that. And, um, and the fact is, it, everyone's spirits are really high. And we were, all, we were all, we were all, we were all, as Sandy and I left. Spirits are high. <laughs> But they are. I mean, that, but that's an important thing. Are. You're not running families, you know. You're, no, I know. You're yourselves. You know, we were told that one of the pods was complete, mm -hmm. but for a leak, you know. So, so yes. it isn't complete, mm -hmm. is the story. And, mm -hmm. you know, I, we don't want to be there until it is leak-proof, sure. warm. But that's why you're here yeah. now, because you're not happy with it there. Yeah, so, so stay yes, here. But, yes, but stay what, here until you're happy with it there. Absolutely. But <laughs> what we can't have is people coming here telling it's complete and everybody's in wild spirits. Yes. And then we go across and find that there's another leak. But, you know. but we haven't done that, Roger. I, you were telling us that everybody's in high spirits. No, you haven't told us it's complete, but we have been told various things are complete and they're patently not. Are we just going to be dumped with all the leaks or are they part of the repair process in the first six months or whatever? Well, if leaks hatch because of nights like last night, you're going to have to repair them. That's life in the Western Isles, I'm afraid. Well, but, but they're they built were... with a Western Isles specification. They are, yes. The harshest weather is going to be now February and March. And if the weather is so bad, it's causing damage to stuff. We're going to need to fix it then and there, mm. not um, get onto the satellite phone and call them out. Isn't that the whole point? Yeah, but isn't that the whole point? Of the, it's only thing I'm going to say. But isn't that the whole point of us being on the island is for us to exist and do stuff ourselves? and not get on the phone and say, hey, I've got Come a block pipe, whatever. Maybe we can just call the local phone. My way of dealing with it is make Lion Television produce what they're supposed to have produced. Everybody else's way seems to be make up for their deficiencies. Well, you know, that's I, what putting I would together have together to... in a community is all about, I thought. Well, I, look, I mean, this is... Uh, this is an artificial community. Whatever anybody says, this is a community created by Lion Television. Now, we they have chosen... We volunteered for this, yeah, remember? But we, well, we volunteered under certain terms, which were that we had accommodation and we had... Our terms were that we were clothed adequately for the Western Isles. We are not adequately clothed for the Western Isles. We are not adequately accommodated for the Western Isles. But say la vie. That's yeah. how I look at it. <laughs> well, we'll make up you, for it you now. You haven't been here. They had. They knew the island. We didn't. So how could you possibly think of everything? It, that was their job. You find out when you go for a project like this and you find out you're going to be inhabiting a, a Western Isle, you know it's going to be cold, you know it's going to be wet, you know it's going so, to be really severe, miserable weather conditions an awful lot of the time. So you buy the things, right, you I'm get it organised. I'm obviously a minority here, so I mean, fine. I I've you, got I my waterproof trousers, are. but I, my opinion is <laughs> that you folk should be making them pay for your waterproof trousers. You're talking about trousers and me and other people lost their crates. We haven't got really vital things that we did think ahead for the year. We brought all these things for the year. I haven't even got my bedding. I haven't got a pillow, I haven't got sheets. I haven't got a pair of boots, I've got a pair of trainers. Um, all the things I did think about bringing have gone. You know, and I'm not prepared to go to that island with all those things that were lost and hear you lot talking about, you know, buying a pair of trousers that you didn't bring. You know, I brought them, where are they? Somewhere floating around the bloody Hebrides. I'm really sorry that Sandy and I came over even to... to so, really sorry we even came over to get your no, ben, view. Ben, 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 Ben. That's, no, that's what Ron said. No, it isn't. People have been in tears here out of sheer frustration. And it's really upsetting, and I just, um... I just begin to think, you know, what am I doing here? It's just... It's just... It's okay. It's okay. By the end of the first week, the 18 castaways on Terence are adjusting to their new life and sharing their thoughts on their weekly video diaries. Well, this is my first video diary. Um, I can't quite believe that I'm doing it, looking so awful. I haven't washed my hair in longer than I care to remember. You know, I hate this um, dread being in front of the camera, but I'm just going to have to face the music and try and do it. Well, here I am again. It's 
quarter past three nearly. I did my other one about two hours ago, but I'm absolutely sure I forgot to put the mic on, so I'm a bit of an arse for that. As you can see, I'm in the best of health. <laughs> <sighs> Just a touch of the old uh, raining <laughs> coughs. <coughs> <coughs> I've had this bit of a cough since you had the flu and, you know, with the damp atmosphere, it doesn't seem to go away. Uh, but I am keep taking the tablets and the odd drop of whiskey, as they say, and uh, hopefully it'll be OK. Anyway, that's it for now. It's been quite a long one. I'll do it again shortly. Bye. Shall I get on with the story? Yes, yeah, sorry, go on. That's uh, all right. Um... You eating that biscuit? <laughs> yes. I'm okay. speaking off camera. OK, sorry. Um... You speak for a bit. OK. Over to you. Thanks. Um, just a quick one to say, um, I can't get out of the room because Liz has locked me in. Oh. Oh, that's lovely, dear. <laughs> Terence here is just so amazing. It's great. I've made really good friends with Claire. Claire's just brilliant. She, um... We play all day. I had a bit of an accident with my, my paw down here. I've had the same socks on for two weeks. That just sounds disgusting. <laughs> but um, I think we all smell the same at this point, so it really doesn't matter. It's a beautiful day today. Everybody's gone for a walk, but I'm in the kitchen cooking, which I do enjoy, and I swore that I would never, ever cook when I came on here. But I must say I've had an absolute ball of a week making food out of things that that just don't exist and making it taste nice. Everybody's getting into a groove of work still. Um, nobody's really bitching as long as Ray gets his meat every day and uh, the veggies get their veggie stuff and vegans get vegan stuff and I get fed. I haven't been laid yet, but that's it's OK. Loads of cold sores as normal. Absolutely loving it. No regrets yet. I think the weather's perfect. And, um... As as I um, as people have pointed out, my only descriptive word is still um, amazing. <laughs> it's week two, and while the pods are progressing, they're still not ready. With the farmhouse full of visiting pod builders, most of the castaways are bedding down in the overcrowded schoolhouse. The congestion isn't helped by Porrig's return to the island. Yeah, Do you know what number bed this is, everyone? What? Thirteen. Yeah. I'm looking for all of us. Yeah. There's fifteen of us. Scary. It's very scary. We'll all have Legionnaire's disease in the morning. <laughs> As far as the space goes, I mean, we're all sort of living on top of each other, and it's something that I never thought I'd be able to cope with. Um, but. I think it's everyone's in crisis mode and everyone's sort of mucking in and um, I'm, I'm not feeling it as, as much. I mean, when I, was, when I lived in London, I was so protective of my personal space and had to have my, my own room and, you know, my flat, which had to be very quiet. And, and here, so far, although it means you don't get as much sleep at night and, it, you know, you're, everything's so chaotic and everyone's losing things, it's, it's not unbearable. In the cramped conditions, a bit of personal space is hard to find, but Ray will do anything to find some, even if it means going to bed earlier than most. That's why I come up here on my own every night. I mean, uh, not that I'm antisocial, but, you know, sometimes with all this talk about what they're going to do and all this, it, you know, it's a bit of a joke to me, you know. So I just come up here. I mean, I've never been a reader of books till I come here. I've never drank whiskey till I come here. And I've started all these things now. I'll be bloody knitting next. The cramped conditions that the castaways are suffering in their living quarters is a stark contrast to the size and scale of the island they inhabit. During breaks in their work schedule, they start to explore their new home and reflect on the new environment they find themselves in. The island is just fantastic and I can't explain what it's like. Yesterday was absolutely stunning. And last night was just oh. so amazing. So much more than I could ever have imagined. And um, um, I just went off alone and 
was so in love with it that uh, very soon I was wondering how I'm going to cope with the end of the year and being quite nostalgic about it before I even start. I've never, ever seen stars in the sky like that. And you could actually see the Milky Way, the band going right across. I mean, you know, bearing in mind all the conditions, the weather here, I mean, it's pouring down now, the rain, with the rain and the wind. <clears throat> Little moments like that make it all worthwhile. Life is fantastic. Sleep in the schoolhouse, warm and cosy every night. Big, big winds out there, big winds. I got round the corner, actually, on the beach side of the schoolhouse, and the wind just hit me, and I was literally crawling on all floors with my sleeping bag, trying to reach the schoolhouse, trying to get up the stones to the schoolhouse. And the wind just took me and lifted me off, and I found myself at the bottom in a pile, and I'd obviously squawked on the way down because um, three or four of the lads from the schoolhouse all ran out in their underwear and rescued me and picked me up off the rocks and brought me inside. It's certainly the strongest wind I've ever encountered in my life. Yeah. Still enjoying it though. Real good fun. Good crowd. Good crack. Good food. Everything. Really enjoying it at the moment. There's certainly something about uh, being here which is mentally very, very restful. The um, issues are very, very simple. It's about food and it's about fuel. It's about um, people. And there are very, very few distractions. The tranquility of their new life comes to an abrupt end during the second week, when Terence is besieged by journalists and photographers, both on the ground and in the air. The flu epidemic and storm damage which prompted some of the castaways to leave the island becomes headline news. If I say, hello, we came over to talk to you. Yeah, I want to talk to us if you don't. If you don't want to talk to us, fine. We're not going to place in the mail and run around and intimidate everyone. Right? Like, you can understand that people uh -huh. want to know what's happening here. That's all. We, we're we're just that, trying to let people know what's happening. That's what the television programmes are for. People want to know now. <laughs> These tabloid journalists, they come, they came to our island and they were running about with a camera and just getting under our feet, really annoying people, really uh, nasty people. So we switched the camera onto them and they hated it. They were running around, scurrying away. Uh, we're intrusive, but you're not intrusive, standing two inches away from my face. Well, if you turn your cameras off, I'll turn mine off. This is a television project. Yep. We just wanted to keep my eye on them the whole time and make them realise, um, give them a similar treatment to the treatment that they were giving us, I suppose. Nobody comes in that steady from now on. We don't give them water, nothing. If they're dying and crawling up that path, we've got timber to make them coffins and they get buried here. They get nothing, no water, no tea, no food, OK? I know a few people have found the press intrusion difficult and, um, and for some reason, I mean, Ray has taken it upon himself to to take a huge dislike. Like, I mean, he he had a little argument with Porig the other day. A little argument. Yeah, a little argument, I'd say. You might have to be nice, but I don't. Right? They shouldn't be here. To I know they shouldn't, but, but, but the best well, thing... Well, I will be not nice to, to anybody what shouldn't be here. Sorry. The best, but the best way to deal with it is just to be polite, Ray. If they walk towards me and they bump into him, well, they've got, to, <laughs> they've got to expect the way I am. So, you just carry on. You be nice well, and I'll not be nice. Not, it's not a huge sacrifice to avoid them. I will try to avoid them, but if they just happen to get in my way, <laughs> well... Uh, <laughs> so why don't you just accept that and keep going on like a bleeding minor bird? But you're hey? going on like a minor bird as well, I think. No, I'm not. You're going on. I'm telling you what I'm going to do. But why can't you adjust your behaviour <laughs> for, for the sake cannot, of the community? I cannot just adjust this my behaviour. I am what I am, so, what I am. All, you that song. Ray, we are all what we are, but we have adjusted our behaviour slightly. I will to, not in adjust order... to journalists. You'll be seeing lots of reporting, because lots of reporters know about this boat. You must respect, though, we've got kids here. Yeah. We, we had a fruit cake over last night, you know, so... Uh, was well, guess what? I don't, no, it wasn't it? It's just... I'm we, sorry, we don't care. What, what we wanted... We what, don't care. You don't care about my children? We can't care. But you don't care about my children? Well, you should care about your children. No. Not to have them a godforsaken place oh. like this. 
my God. What's wrong, Trish? I've just said, said to him, have a bit of respect, and he's just took an attitude saying, I don't care, I don't care, but you're what I mean, it's not This is it's obvious the man's not a grandfather or a dad, he's just told me that he is a dad. The man's got an attitude. I have kids here, and if I've got to push you off here, you respect that. You come back with a better attitude and a bit of care, and then that's fine. But you respect my kids and my kids' safety. Watch this space, and nobody will be coming off town saying next year. We will be here through thick and thin, wind, rain, snow, sleet. Prove a point. At the end of the second week, there was a much more welcome arrival on Tarrancay. Our letters. <laughs> Today I am postman. The fortnightly mailboat is the castaway's only official contact with the outside world, bringing with it deliveries of essential supplies and the all important mailbag. Written correspondence will be the castaway's only contact with friends and family for the whole year, and the arrival of the post quickly becomes the high point of the week and a great social event. You are so nice. I want you to come back because I love you so much. You are the best nanny in the world. I really want you to come back. I love you so much. <laughs> <laughs> oh, he says thanks for all your boring letters. <laughs> this is a card that I got um, from my dad's brother and they split up about 27 years ago and they never ever spoke and he was a, a good uncle to us when we were younger and we actually thought he was dead and I've just had a card now just saying good luck to you, you deserve it I hope you succeed in this project your gran Adams who was um, my dad's mum would be proud of you. If you're down, sing Chirpy Chirpy Cheep Cheep, Love Uncle Eddie, which was a song that we used to sing on the way up to the Highlands when we were going camping. Aww. We used to sing Chirpy Chirp, and I honestly thought, I honestly thought he was dead. Trish, any money in the car? <laughs> <laughs> well, listen, this is priceless. Oh, yeah. This is priceless, so... <laughs> and I've had a letter of my mum, who, for the first time ever, has approved of me! Oh, <laughs> my mother's proud of me now! <laughs> as well as letters from friends and family, the castaways get their first taste of celebrity status following the transmission of the first series of programmes. Seeing you both on telly has been very interesting. After working with you for over a year, Des, I was surprised to see you lose your rag twice in two episodes. You should have, you should have done that here. But I have to admit, I never once saw you flare up at work. Liz comes across as an absolute sweetie. Is this good cop, bad cop routine? And <laughs> um, Ben, I must say, he's being the star of this episode. He is so nice, charming, kind and fit. Oh, well, <laughs> if by any chance he turns gay during the year, give him my number. <laughs> Oh, wait, oh, wait, no, Mom. Put gay chat like. <laughs> but not all the castaways feel comfortable about their new celebrity status. God, everyone's obviously got expectations about me, and um, oh my gosh, what 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 happens if I don't if I don't keep up with them? Um, you know, all the reviews said God, Ben is just such a lovely, helpful, thoughtful person, and I can't help but thinking, oh my God, I've got twelve months. Can I? Can can I? I mean, yeah, I'd like to think that that was how I am, and that is me. But I've got 12 months solid just thinking, oh my gosh, what happens if I break at any stage? It's going to be so embarrassing because I'm going to, you know, break everyone's expectations of, of how I should be reacting. So, so the second part is I, I suddenly feel a pressure that I didn't think I was going to have. Ben soon finds himself under even more pressure when some late-night drinking with the last of the builders raises the prospect of a beard-growing competition. Uh, so, so this, this clink of glasses would be no shaving, no cutting. Yeah, until June until what? 21st. Until summer solstice. Yeah, June, June the 21st. 2003. Who is in on this? Well, the four of us, Trevor, Ben, Patrick and me. If I grow everything, like all hair down here and beard down here, is that going to reduce my brilliance? Does it change your voice as well when you grow <laughs> 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 it's, it's, it's a yes, it would dramatically reduce your pulling power. Well, Cheers, <laughs> Ben! 
as yet there's been very little uh, discussion uh, in the abstract of any sort of issues although there's beginning to emerge again I'm sure it will intensify reflection on the notion of fairness and of you know pulling one's weight I got up this morning half past six made the fires made the breakfast nobody showed up so that was a waste of three hours look I told you earlier <laughs> you know, I do what I'm <laughs> <laughs> Some of them think it's f***ing bucklings, I'm sure they do. Uh, they talk a good show, <laughs> you know what I mean? But when it comes, this is about four or five, drafted, and uh, the rest are f***ing playing. I think Ray is the most wonderful person. He really makes me laugh, and I really admire him and really respect him, and just think he's incredibly funny. But I, he also makes me feel so guilty. <laughs> They've got to do a full... I don't think none of them's capable of doing a full day's work. I'm convincing that. They'll do about an hour, and then they'll gallivant. I just find Ray and Peter and Patrick and various other people just make me feel guilty um, for for kind of a little bit of um, loafing every now and then. I don't get bored easily, but I like to have lots of variations. So even working at Tatler, I would have 10 different projects to do at the same time. So I would say, I'd start doing one, and then I'd get a little, little bit bored, and I'd go, OK, let's try the next one, and I'd do the next one. And then I'd go back, and I'd swip, and I'd swap. And unfortunately, Ray has this thing in his mind that you have to stick to one job solidly all day long. And I know that's probably the way you have to do it in the building trade. Or, you know, maybe even in life. And maybe I'm just very lucky that I've come from a job where I could I could just sit back and choose when I wanted to do it. Like last you know, last yesterday afternoon when it was so beautiful and all I wanted to do was just go for a little walk. It was the most beautiful day yet. Um but no well I did. I, I snuck off and then Ray didn't talk to me for a little bit. And um but I suppose that's what it's gonna be like. Everyone has different expectations and different ways of doing things. And mine is I drift off quite a lot, as in my mind wanders, as does my body. <laughs> I don't know. I'm glad the Russians are friends with us. In a bid to improve the work ethic amongst the younger castaways, Ray and Peter put them to work where they can see them, while they get on with some chicken fencing 50 yards away. What are we doing here? We're digging big oh. holes, <laughs> as usual. Playing out. <laughs> big, that's big that's what we do on this island. Just dig, dig holes. Dig. Yeah. We'll be going through shortly. We don't really know what for. We just get Ray and Peter to come up and say, <laughs> let's dig a big hole. <laughs> I think they just want to keep us busy. Yeah. <laughs> just keeping the youngsters at work. I think, oh, yeah. yes. I think they were worried there wasn't enough work going on, so they said, yeah, let's just dig about 10,000 million holes. Drag <laughs> a few of them out of bed <laughs> yeah. and get them working. <laughs> Just smile and wave. Peter is Ray <laughs> watching us from a distance, <laughs> shouting. <laughs> it's like two... <laughs> Granddad. Two, it's the, you, know, you know in the Muppet show? There's the two, two grandpas in the, uh, in the in balcony. The <laughs> Molly and Molly. <laughs> it's We're like... Molly and Molly. <laughs> Whoa. We gave uh, Ben, Trevor and Toby uh, a job to do down there. And we told them we'd put in uh, pig fencing in. You know, and we just spotted it. We dug it. out the holes for We just we? spotted it, and I just said to Peter, we're not having giraffes, are we? <laughs> All that's basically happened is that, as usual, we get the bad end of the job. So, Ray and Pete start it. God love them. <laughs> right. They dig all the holes with a really fun machine. They go, <laughs> with that noise as well, yeah. it does. And then from there, we're asked to dig them deeper, wider, <laughs> put the poles in and concrete them, <laughs> which we've done. Which is fine. But as Ray's just come over and informed us that the poles needed to be cut in half, but what the problem is is that if we would have cut the poles like three or four times, he would have moaned that they weren't cut right. But nobody told us that they were meant to be cut anyway. They said that you didn't tell them that they needed to be sorted. <laughs> well, well, <I've>, we <laughs> thought it was common, common sense. sense, you see. <laughs> you know, but uh, I mean, Trevor's supposed to have been in the, you know, a, a man of the world. But, uh, I don't know. <laughs> hey? <laughs> when brains come out, they must have missed that lot. <laughs> Ray thinks we've built a giraffe pen now. Mm. Because it's to keep what in on our pigs? <laughs> Is it pigs we're getting tomorrow? I'll do that, eh? <laughs> <laughs> oh, 
I wouldn't hold this for anybody else, you know, uh, can you? Um, you wouldn't trust any of the youngsters? Phew! What? I'd end up in bloody hospital like the rest of them. <laughs> what? what? It's a lot Whoa! <laughs> 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 Is that still straight? I think I better just check that. <laughs> <laughs> There's certainly a... a <laughs> well, it's not a division, but between the young and the old. And we were all talking, the, the young as such, um, we were all saying, God, if it was just us here, <laughs> all we do all day is like have a big sleep in, go for a big walk, get completely trolleyed in the evening, and we just get by, we just make beans on toast or something. I don't know. I don't know. It's not, not exactly like that. But, um, but I, we certainly wouldn't have the kind of guilty feelings that we have. It's the end of week two. And across the water on the Isle of Harris, the families are staying in holiday cottages, dealing with the constant press attention as to why they are not on Taransay. In a bid to reduce some of this pressure, they are invited to either return to the mainland or go over to Taransay. Three of the families decide to stay put, but the Stevenson family take up the invitation and fly to London to await developments. The castaways who are staying away from the island visit Taransay whenever they can to join in with the work effort. And when Ron comes over to visit, he brings with him a letter to the community from Roger and Rosemary Stevenson. There has been considerable resentment that there has been no doctor on site. Right. Yeah. <laughs> and we would like to. I, I would like to hear this letter. Yes. Yeah. yeah. And it says, "Dear Castaways, we've been very excited about Castaway 2000 for many months. We can see enormous potential in the project, and are sure that it will be, and are sure that it will be a great success when it gets properly underway." We feel we have a lot to offer the community, in brackets, and indeed already have behind the scenes, close bracket, <clears throat> but not at any price. We would be happy sharing a room with our children for the year, and if we are to, if we are to, to occupy the Mackay house, as suggested, sharing the house with one other family. Overcrowding is an intolerable burden to impose on us, um, impose on us as we attempt to create a community in such a hostile environment. Sadly, we feel that our only option is to leave until what, is promised at Wi until what was promised at Windermere has been delivered. We send you all our very best wishes, Rosemary and Roger. It seems from our point of view, living in, you know, as I say, beds full of nails and plasterboard and so yeah. on and so forth, there's a sort of certain, you know, lack of a, an ability to compromise that the rest of us are quite happy to do. Everybody involved in my part of the selection process has known that Rosemary and Roger have had their criteria under which they will undertake this project. What is the criteria? No hardship whatsoever, because if there's going to be no hardship, there's no program. Well, going I don't to be think they would have really be involved in the project if they were expecting no hardship. Here we are, a community in really diff difficult circumstances mm. with people going down like flies, mm. and we have no doctor. We have no support here. We don't even have any medicine, medicines. Me. We don't we have, have any nothing. bandages. Because Roger's got all the supplies. By, because of the sheer necessity of having a doctor, as we understand it for insurance purposes, puts the, has put them in a bargaining position that's different from the rest of us. Yeah. And that ain't fair. Back in his hotel, Ron calls Roger and Rosemary in London. I read the letter out and then they said um, sort of what they really want to know is the nuts and bolts of your criteria and the differences between what they were and what they are now. We're all being flexible, why can't other people be flexible? And when you're living in these conditions, <laughs> you know, with the rain driving in and we haven't put mats down and walkways and so on and so forth to sleep above it, to, to have somebody saying, oh, well, we won't move in until there's a wooden floor, it just feels a little bit ripe. And, I, and sort of, or everybody gets sort of deeply, you know, of, not, well, yeah, it just becomes a joke. And, and that's the way the group is forming itself around that issue. And then they wanted to know, like, you know, uh, there was this thing about um, if one of the roofs blew off and it was pissing down with rain, would you and Roger get out with the rest of us, you know, with a hammer and nails and, 
And I said, well, I can't imagine Roger and Rosemary sitting there while their kids are getting absolutely soaked, not doing anything, so, you know. He wants to come with all his comforts and I'm afraid he's not going to get him. Because I won't lift a finger for him. You know, that's me just personally. I mean, I don't know about the others, but he won't get done anything off me. He's on his own as far as I'm concerned. Rosemary and Roger are concerned that um, some members of the community that are on the island uh, might not want them to come back. Um, and so Roger's going to come up from London um, and come over to the island and speak to the members of the community that have concerns about how committed they are um, on a nuts and bolts level to the project. Well, I, I don't know what to say and how to say it, but I fought so hard for what I thought we were going to get when we first started on this project. And all along we've been re reassured that we'd have this. And I, I don't feel that I can suddenly change our goal, move our goalposts. Um, we want space for our kids that is safe and uh, to learn and play in. Um, and we want our own private room for the four of us. I, I don't see that as a very great demand. <coughs> um, uh. What we've been hearing is like, it's like the rumour mill working. It's like, yes. well, Roger isn't happy until this is done, that's done, blah de blah is done. And we haven't really known exactly what is true and what is not true. So, I mean, if you're here saying today, you know, you need, you need X, Y, Z completed, well, That's fine, and everyone just needed to hear that. It's just that we haven't had that communication. <laughs> you know, I, I am here as one of us. I want to dig carrots and repair the roof and put a slate back on, and, you know, I want to do that sort of stuff, and I don't know how it's got about that I'm unwilling to do <coughs> that. It's ridiculous. He looked so poorly, I thought. I know he's been a little bit ill, but I, I must say, I, I, I suddenly, all of this, all of the... All of the complaints about Roger needs this, Roger needs that kind of just fell away for me and I just thought, oh no, I feel really bad. He's been a, a lot of upset about his lack of concern for us all and I think seeing him made us feel better about him being part of the whole project. Although I'm still left with some um, uncertainty as to how much effort he's going to put into just the general mucking in and working with everybody, whether he's going to be very demanding of um, things in the future beyond just the material um, quality of, of his house. I think that in that meeting that we had early this morning, people were more unwilling to admit what's been said um, constantly, in my opinion, than on camera than, than they had been saying in you know, the dark, rainy nights, if you see what I mean. While the community waits to see when, or indeed if, the Stevensons will return to the island, life continues without them. Rules are drawn up about how they will live and work together, but it proves more difficult to reach an agreement over what food they will eat and who should cook it. All the castaways have strong views about what they want to eat, but the task of cooking and washing up for the community is the least popular job on the island. It's decided that everyone must take a turn in the kitchen to cook and clean, but conflict quickly develops when castaway filmmaker Tanya is accused of not pulling her weight. I don't really want to make it a personal thing. When you lay down rules, you stick by them, and if not, you're allowed to say that those rules haven't been fulfilled. And one of the rules was, you know, about cleaning up pans, leaving a tidy kitchen and so on and so forth. It's a very stressful, long day. I mean, I know that. But there's also the manner in which you approach it and someone was having a Can I finish my, saying what I'm saying, oh, you please? You came to a pause, please. Sorry, I, and I didn't come to a pause. Okay. And uh, um, the manner which I said was completely neutral. I said, I think that this kitchen is uh, not up to, the, up to the required standard or equivalent was in a very, in my terms, neutral uh, voice. What happens is, I'm a very big person, I'm an old person, I'm a bearded person, people project onto me all sorts of, uh, of, of their own thoughts. I was very, very neutral. I wasn't being angry or anything. I was deeply upset by the response I got. I think that if there's a rule and you say that rule should be followed, and if you, if you bring it to anybody's attention, they should say, well, perhaps they, should, they shouldn't respond in an emotional way. 
I'm not going to go into particularly how you spoke to me, Peter, but I'm not an emotional person by any means, and I don't... I don't know. There were several things that happened yesterday that were exceptional, like the power going off for an hour, so we didn't have any light, like the fact that I was called away to film about three times, like the fact that Mike had to go and mend the generator, and it all just meant that we got behind on the washing up. You know, I, I hate the idea that anyone would think that I'm not pulling my weight. I'd hate that. Yes, I, I, so... That wasn't it. I mean, I, 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 can, I, can I respond to well, that? No, I haven't, oh, right, sorry, I haven't quite sorry, finished, okay. but, I mean, when I went back in there, I, I mean, I just, I'm sorry, I really think you were rude to me. Okay. I really do. Fine. I just thought we'd agreed certain things, and they, I felt that they were gradually slipping. And I think that in the beginning of a community, because mm. I've lived in one for 25 years, if you don't establish the rules and stick to them, other conventions begin to develop, and it's a very dangerous precedent. Something really important has been left behind here, that somebody was hurt and upset and crying that night, and it should not have got to that. I'm sorry, Peter, but it should not. So how are you supposed to say it? You communally, you do not direct it at one person. No, you see, I would argue that it's much more hurtful to do it, to do it in public. And uh, my, my attitude to it was there are rules, there was an agreement, and the agreement was broken. And that's to me. I'm, I'm very, I'm, I'm very simple <laughs> on this one. If we, if we don't stick to the rules we make, we might as well give up. Well, I think a lot of what we're going through at the moment is learning different it's people's exactly styles. Different and Peter, you've got a style. Yeah. I mean, we've all got a style, and we've got to learn to live with one another's styles. Yeah. And I think it's just going to take some time. These sort of meetings ought to be, ought to be a, a situation where we can say any, f express any fears or f feelings that there might be um, awkwardness, exactly. and it must all come out into the open and we must all be able to express it in our different ways. Stung by this criticism, Tanya retires to the video diary room in the farmhouse to lick her wounds. It's almost turned into a bit of a a sort of a patriarchy rather than a democracy. Yeah. You've got the elders, you've got two, perhaps Peter and Ray being the sort of the elder male figures yeah. ruling over. Yeah, which is just everything I did not want to happen. I did warn people. I mean, right, right throughout the, all the selection process, people saying, oh, he's an easygoing, laid back sort of bloke. And I said, no, but watch out, I can be a bit of a bastard at times. I've said it very explicitly over and over again. Um, I, 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 and then part of that comes from part of that comes from my experience of, as I said in the meeting, of living with a group of people where I felt one of the mistakes we made was not being explicit enough at the beginning. We've all got an idea about how we want this community to run, and I thought we were coming here to build some sort of utopia. Mm, mm. And yet, we're all bringing our prejudices with us. Yeah. And because I think many of us haven't been with a complete cross section of society before, it's a, it's a huge eye opener. Mm, mm, then you it suddenly is. realise that there. are... Uh, that, that still goes on. It's know. like, whoa. Yeah. Because it's because it doesn't, or it's, re it's much far rarer in our generation. Yeah, it is. Just because I'm male and I'm big and I'm old, I don't, I, I, I you know, I, as I said earlier, I am equally sensitive. Equally. People don't seem to realise this. As the first month draws to an end, the castaways reflect on their island experience. There's a few of it downhearted, there's a few not, and there's a few just switched off. But um, it's all down to the elements, I think, you know, and getting used to it. I'm really enjoying getting my hands dirty and doing practical stuff, and actually sort of doing physical things for a living as opposed to just talking about ideas for a living. I have to say, what I normally do uh, in London is far easier. Um, but at the moment, I'm currently probably enjoying this more because it's, it's novelty and I'm just learning new things. And I'm not quite as clumsy or unpractical um, as I once thought, so that's quite good. So different to what I was having before, where I was, had to get up at 7.30 every morning, trudge to Leeds on the train, which was always packed, full of moody, miserable people. Uh, I'd get to work and there'd be pressure from the start all day long to get the work done. And thank God I'm not doing that anymore. I'm so lucky I've got away from it. I'm here. Thank God for that. Half of it is just, mm, you know, just the most beautiful time ever. And the other half has actually been quite stressful. I can't 
describe what it's like being here, it's been just fantastic. I've loved every second of it, even the wind and the rain and the mud and the... It's just been great. Off for a beautiful day, gazing at snow-capped peaks. Terrible life we're having here. Absolutely awful. <laughs> Back in the kitchen, there are rumblings of discontent from some of the male castaways who are unhappy at having to do the cooking and cleaning. Can I have a tea break? What, again? <laughs> you've, well, had, you've had three a day. Come on, let's uh, be... Uh, it's getting heavy, though. Right. He just works you far too hard, you know. Far too hard. He must think I'm a white yes. The loudest complaints come from Ray, who resents being in the kitchen and is increasingly worried about the lack of meat and two veg in his castaway diet. I'll save that for the sandwich later on. That's for the When Ray announces that he will no longer be doing his weekly kitchen duties, it's Des who intervenes to remind him of his responsibilities to the rest of the community. You're tending to get the same people now doing the cooking and, um, you know, we, we've got to make sure that they don't get into their minds that they'll be doing it all year, because otherwise people will get really... People will just take the piss and we're not having that. If one of the women in the kitchen would have asked me to do it, I would have said, but I'm sick of him trying to run the show and being running about like a blue ass fly all the time. Now it's just trying to get the place safe for all the families and all that, and that's what I'm doing. And uh, for me to spend my time in the kitchen and other people to be walking about all day, it's just not on. So uh, I just says I'm not coming in the kitchen. I did a stint last Thursday and I said no. So he kept going on like a bloody old woman, you know. And uh, I said to him, what we just said? Did I say no then? And then I just lost my rag with me, him. It's, uh, it's just a pain at the arse in times. And, uh, you know, it, pff, the way I am, it's just, you know, I mean, I'm not, uh, what they call it, I won't let the lid go or anything, but it's just got to be told and put in its place. Ray and Dares bury the hatchet and make up in time for Burns Night dinner and a variation on the traditional piping of the haggis. <laughs> Over on the Isle of Harris, dinner is a more muted affair as the frustrations of not being on the island continue to mount. Well, let's make the most of it, because we've got a few more days left here, and then we're really going to be unwimpy. Yeah, we don't really want to be here. <laughs> I'm sitting here in this... Yeah. Play, in this There's cottage, no twiddling our fingers. Well, I mean, we didn't come so here to, to be here, did we? It's been a completely disastrous start to the project for me, um, and for quite a lot of other people, I think. Uh, but for me, it started to go wrong. It started to go wrong at the Carlo Lockhouse Hotel, really, when the bath plug didn't fit. I know it was a, a sensible decision to come back, because I really wasn't very well. But now that I'm feeling better, I'm desperate to get over there. We have an option to either quit and go home um, or wait until the island is ready. I am not a quitter, you know what I'm saying? I like to, if I commit myself to something, I like to see it through. A <sighs> uh, lot of pressure, like a caged tiger. And visiting the island from time to time doesn't seem to ease that. Uh, the only thing that does ease is the fact that we know that the island, people that are on the island are with us all the way. I have a great deal of respect for the people that are already on the island, um, mucking in and sharing tents for a room. And um, But I go over to the island and I see that some of them are looking really unwell. Have you seen what these people are like over there? Have you seen the way they're completely demoralised? Back on the island, the Celtic castaways, Porrig and Mike, sing for their supper of haggis, neeps and tatties. The after-dinner conversation centres on Ben's beard, as he tells visiting project psychologist Cynthia McVeigh all about his stubble trouble. 
everyone talked about the pros and cons of drinking whiskey. <laughs> I'm growing a beard, a beard. <laughs> so, Ben, if you if you back out on this deal that we have made together, then um, you will have four people who can demand pretty much how what many? they... How many people? Four. four. There were five in the deal. How many? How, sorry, how many? Four. Oh, right. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I'm a bit slow. <laughs> <laughs> I need a drink. Hold on. <laughs> <laughs> no, 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 no. There's a very different mood at the other end of the steading, where the recent pressures experienced by Ray are starting to tell. He's got one leg. It's a work in the kitchen instead of about. Yeah, go on, get up. Ray, there's no point. You're lazy. Well, there's no point in getting overexcited. Right, all right, all right. Calm down, calm down. It could do a job, but it won't do. The shouting doesn't help. Stay in the bed till three o'clock. And don't tell me you're lazy. The f***ing Sunday, Ray, it's none of your f***ing business, you oh, fat yeah, f***ing 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 You're a lazy Hey, hey Ray, hey, what's going no, on? No, I'm f***ing sick of these f***ing uh, earthlings you've got here. And we're sick of you, you fat snoring Hey, 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 Come on, Ray. 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 Come on,